I just, hello, I just wanted to say a couple of things before we actually get started. Um, um, I want to thank y'all for hanging out, coming, taking time out of your day to come. It's definitely appreciated and not taken for granted. I also want to let you know that at any time, you know, you want to get up and go get something to drink or eat or whatever, it's, it's not a problem or go to the bathroom. Whatever you have to do, it's not a problem. Just do your thing, come on back. Uh, the other thing is, <clears throat> Um, if you, I would like for you to participate in whatever your comfort level is. Uh, I might present some things that might be a challenge to the mindset, and I have no problem being challenged, my thoughts being challenged and questioned. And so feel totally comfortable sharing your thoughts um, or even challenging me or my thoughts or whatever I present. And if <clears throat> we're going to use this mic here, if you don't use the mic, we won't hear you on film. So don't be bashful about just picking the mic up and using it if you have something to say so that we can, so that we can um, hear you on the video. And uh, anybody got any questions before we get rolling? No questions? All right, cool. Um, I just got to get some water. I got to get some water. You ready to rock and roll, Stan? Yes, sir. Jason, I'm glad you're hanging out with us. I do have a question. Yeah. Can we introduce ourselves since some of us don't know each other? Yeah, that's what I'm a. Yeah, we're going to, once we get rolling, uh, we're going to do that. So you ready to rock and roll, Stan? <clears throat> All right, it's on and popping. It's official. All right. Um, I am Alfonso McGriff III. I invited people here to come and talk about how to have what I call a harmonious and productive interaction. I call that conscious conversations. Um, at this point, I just want to pass the mic so everybody can introduce each other however they choose. And then after the introductions, we have it. And everybody's sitting here with the same basic understanding that um, I want to share something and you're not necessarily clear what it is I want to share until I actually <laughs> share it. So we all starting at the same place for the most part. So I'm going to pass the mic and you introduce yourselves however you choose. Peace. I'm Empress Ayana, the owner and founder of Onyx Restorative Justice, or ORJ. Thank you so much, Alfonso, for the invite to be a part of this. William Clark. Nefresha Johnson, and I am an educator from Georgia. Hello, everyone. Keisha Tindall. Hi, everybody. I'm Perry, Perry Drake, and I'm just here representing me. Hi, my name is Millie Brooks. I'm from New Jersey, and I'm also a teacher. I'm Theo Wilson, and I'm also here in support, and also I'm a seeker. Um, and this brother has deeply enriched my life, so I had to come. Drove all the way from Jersey. Hello, my name is Danielle McBride, and I am an avid learner. I love learning new things and gathering as much information as I can to help along my journey. Hello, I'm Val Samuel from Breakthrough Clinical Services, and I am here to learn more knowledge. Good evening, Marcia Whittingham. I'm just here as a longtime friend and associate, and um, I guess somewhat entrepreneurial here in Hartford also. Good evening, my name is Abdul Rahman Ibn Muhammad, and um, I'm just here to hear about Conscious Conversations. Well, thank, 
thank, thank, thank you all for hanging out. What I would like to do first is just give you a brief understanding of how this all came about. Um, back in 1998, I would say, I was heavily involved in, in, in poetry and sharing words and, and the arts in that way. But I was also extremely angry. <clears throat> I began introducing myself to our history and understanding how we came to be, or when I say we, I'm talking about African people in America. And as I continued to read, the more angry I got. And then I had wonderful instigators like Minister Louis Farrakhan and Brother Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad and I can name any number of other people who assisted me with my anger. And so I, um, I, I made my first journey to Africa, to West Africa, to Senegal. And I was so heated when I was there and saw that we didn't control anything. For three days, I didn't even talk. I became a mute <laughs> and people didn't understand. But uh, that's how just, anger filled I was. I was so angry I couldn't even speak. And um, when I came back home, uh, the anger continued. I, um, and, I, and I would study for the purpose of verbally removing somebody's head if they said something that I didn't think made sense or that I didn't think was right. And if they couldn't verbally handle myself, my goal was to totally destroy them verbally now. So we won't ever have that problem again. I was, I was on a real rampage. And uh, one day I was at a party. It was a, it was a party of, it was a lot of artists, poets and writers and actors and actresses and people in the arts. And so I was at a party. And it was a, a big conversation going on in the kitchen. And I walked in the kitchen. And of course, people like me, you know, you get a reputation. And so I walked in the kitchen and about two thirds of the people just saw me and just walked out. In the mid sentence, everything just started filing right out the kitchen as soon as I came in the kitchen. And my little feelings was hurt. <laughs> and, but it wasn't that hurt at the time. It was very impactful because my thought was I want to be heard too. But because of the energy and spirit that I had, there was one person who remained in the kitchen who was adamant about not being intimidated by me. So they were ready. You know, sometimes when you hostile and aggressive the way I was, you come in and there are people who are just ready for you. And so he was ready, and I got in a good, loud argument with him. <laughs> and, but the, the impact of those people filing out of the kitchen still lingered with me. And so I began thinking that if I want to be heard, I have to begin adjusting how I interact with people. And so I started making these little adjustments and with some people, even today, that was 1998. How many years is this later now? 1998, and then the 2008, 2000, 21. 21 years later, there are people that still, like there's a saying that said, it's, 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 not, it's not what you said, it's how you made a person feel. Mm -hmm. And there are people to this day who still have a problem with me because of how I presented myself 21 years ago. And I understand that. I don't take it personal or hold it any kind of way. I just continue on my journey to, to grow and evolve. So um, as I started trying these different things and I started noticing how different things were working, I started taking note. And so long story short, I just pretty much finished a book called The Roots of a Tree. And If the roots aren't strong and in, in order and intact, the tree is null and void. 
So the book is called The Roots of a Tree because I believe that at the root of everything successful, there must be harmonious and productive communication involved somewhere. You, you just can't get things done. And, um, and so it's called The Roots of a Tree. And then the subtitle is McGriff's Unique Approach to Harmonious and Productive Communication. So tonight what I'd like to do is introduce what I call these six guidelines for having a harmonious and productive interaction. And then put a couple of subjects on the table and then let the conversation go where it may. And we just discuss it. Um, I have these handouts that I gave out. And this is just like a, a handout. But I didn't just want to give you a folder with some old reprints. And, but I also wanted to give you I'm rubbing. Does everybody have one in the handout? Oh, okay, cool. So we good? Um, so did we stop right where I was or? Roots of the tree. Yeah, so um, yeah, so the name of the book is The Roots of a Tree. And um, because I believe at the foundation of everything successful, there must be a harmonious and productive interaction. And, uh, and, and the subtitle is McGriff's Unique approach to harmonious and productive communication. So what I like to do is read the guidelines to you. Now, at the end of all of these work, these, um, these handouts, at the end is two blank pages. And, and everybody should have a pen. So if you have any thoughts about anything that I'm saying as I go through these guidelines so you won't forget them, please just jot them down. And so you won't feel like you got to interrupt me before you forget what you're going to say. Just jot them, jot them down and, uh, and then we can address the questions after I finish going over the six guidelines. Is that cool? All right. So um, and then after we finish the six guidelines and go over any questions that you might have, then we'll put a couple of thoughts on the table and deal with those. Are y'all with me? The other thing too, even though we're speaking into a mic, we still have to project so everybody at the table can hear what we're saying. Because he can just, if you're too loud or whatever, that's no problem, he can just turn it down and he can make the adjustment on the mic, but we still have to project at the table so we can all hear each other. Are y'all with me? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. A conscious conversation is an informed, reasoned, and progressive approach to having a harmonious and productive verbal interaction. This approach promotes skill enhancement in the areas of emotional intelligence, conflict resolution, and critical thinking. Such relationship building skills are essential for navigating and negotiating one's place in an increasingly global society where personal referrals and social media have become key components for long-term success. When participating in the conscious conversation, understanding is the ultimate goal. We ask questions and share information. We take responsibility for and control over our personal prejudices and emotions, which if left unchecked can disrupt a conscious conversation. Having a conscious conversation can be a challenge for those who have not experienced McGriff's unique approach to harmonious and productive communication. 
is quite the deviation from the traditional approach to having a conversation. We discourage arguing and debating and encourage listening, observing, thinking, learning, sharing, and growing, which can potentially bring understanding. Every conversation has the potential to be a conscious conversation. So, the six basic guidelines for having a conscious conversation. The mind is like a fingerprint. There's a reason why we see things differently. I say the mind is like a fingerprint. There's a reason why we see things differently because if we understand that the mind is truly like a fingerprint, then our thought process would be such that it's only natural for people to see things differently than I do, as opposed to moving with the expectation that people are supposed to see it how I see it. But if the mind is like a fingerprint and we truly understand that, then it's almost natural to expect that people will see things differently and that's the reason for the conversation now. So now I can help you understand how I see it, you help me understand how you see it. If we truly understand this, as I said, our most productive approach to interaction, we would expect that others will see things differently than how we see things. We now have the purpose for conversation. Understanding is why we speak. A conscious conversation is what we can have. There is no environment or reality that we can inhibit that will not have rules of engagement and a belief system or approach to life, whether it be with or without people in the forest or in outer space. You have to come up, we have to develop some type of belief system or approach to life. There are six basic guidelines for having a conscious conversation. These guidelines embody the foundation for McGriff's unique approach to harmonious and productive communication. Guideline number one, during a conscious conversation, understanding what the person is saying is much more important than agreement or disagreement. We do not look for agreement or disagreement. We also do not agree to disagree. It's not necessary during a conscious conversation. Either we understand or we don't understand. Um, every, people are not going to always understand us. If I'm talking calculus and they only understand addition and subtraction, they're just not going to understand. And sometimes we have to realize when people are not going to understand. And sometimes we have to also realize when we're not going to understand. Because, you know, sometimes we're not at that place. We're not ready. Guideline number two, during a conscious conversation, we try to avoid passive aggressive behavior while the speaker has the floor. This would include sarcasm, raising one's hand over and over again, making negative facial expressions associated with disagreement, and texting or toying with the smartphone while the speaker has the floor. Guideline number three, during the conscious conversation, we challenge the idea, concept, or philosophy with questions and thoughts. However, we never engage in intentionally discouraging remarks or personal attacks. Some of us are not comfortable speaking with people um, or may not be as verbally and intellectually equipped to explain and present our ideas as others may be. For this reason, the cynical listeners may sometimes digress to ask additional difficult questions, exploiting verbal weaknesses and hurling insults and personal attacks especially if the speaker is trying to share a perspective that differs from those who are listening. So we, we, we avoid personal attacks and intentionally discouraging remarks when the speaker has the floor. Guideline number four. During a conscious conversation, if more, if more than one person is speaking at a time, we declare that behavior as fighting and we do not want fights. We desire understanding. Traditionally, many of us are accustomed to cutting each other off and interrupting one another during a conversation. This just may be the greatest challenge for most people who are trying to have a conscious conversation. We do have a lot of wonderful reasons for cutting each other off. And the most classic one is, I don't mean to cut you off, but. <laughs> well, no, you do mean to, because you <laughs> just did it. So, um, yeah, so. Guideline number five. Five and six are kind of challenging. During a conscious conversation, we never announce that someone is wrong. We're not having a conversation to figure out who's right or wrong, and we're not in a traditional classroom. So it's okay during a conscious conversation for this. Um, yeah, so it's okay during a conscious conversation for the speaker and those listening not to worry about being right or wrong. Guideline number six: During a conscious conversation, everyone is right. No one is wrong. 
the only relevant history that we bring to a conversation is our own and it is our, our truth. When we come to a conversation with our mindset already understanding that everyone is right, we have no reason to try and convince anyone of anything. We share our limited understanding is associated with our truth and allow others to do the same. So um, everyone is right. No one is wrong. Even to the extent, uh, even to the extent that if I say, If I say 2 plus 2 is 4, and somebody comes behind me and says 2 plus 2 is 5, in a conscious conversation, we're both right. The goal is to find out how I got 4 and how they got 5. And even if we don't understand how they got 5, it's still OK, because that's their truth. One of the questions I ask people is, 2 plus 2 is 4, how do you know that? Well, when you stop and think, the only thing you can say is, this is how I was raised and taught. You know, this is that's the, best, that's the best we can do. And everybody comes to the table with how they were raised and taught. And so one of the major reasons I was talking to my brother um, about this, one of the major reasons why I think harmonious and productive communication among black folks is so important is because we presently live in a situation where the rhythm of this nation and the world is conflict and confrontation. When we watch the news, people are hurling insults and fighting and yelling at each other. And then we have reality shows where there's constant conflict and confrontation. And so everywhere young people turn is conflict and conversation, so that has become the norm, whether it's adults or young people. And then the other challenge we have as what is called African Americans is that unlike when a group of Spanish people sit down to have a meeting, they all are speaking the same language, eating the same food, listening to the same music, coming from the same historical cultural background. The same, the, the people we compare ourselves to, the same with Jewish, what I call Jewish Europeans. They sit down and they come with the same understanding from a cultural standpoint. Um, my Indian brothers and sisters, literally from India, when they sit down and have a meeting, they're coming from the same cultural standards and foundation. When the so-called African Americans sit down to have a meeting, a group such as us, we're coming, from, um, we're coming from our colonial conditioning. We all coming from different places of how we were conditioned. So uh, my brother might need to pray five times a day. My, my Christian brother or sister might want to open and close the meeting with a prayer. Uh, somebody else who's not a um, Christian or whatever don't, don't want to hear none of it. And so when we come to the table, we're coming from all kinds of different places. And if we, my British, I call them my British Islanders, my brothers and sisters, they like to, to call a meeting at 7 and then like drink tea and have a conversation till like 8.30 and then start the meeting. So, you know, we, we come from these different places. And that's why it's so important, so much more important for us to focus a lot more on harmonious and productive interaction because of the challenges associated with being as quote unquote African American. So right now let's I just want to open it up. Does anybody have any questions about the, the, the guidelines? Any challenges, any thoughts? Because um I've I've talked to some ministers and they said there's no way in the world everybody's right. Just, 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 nobody you you can't say everybody's right. And and I say, I understand you can't, but, but I can. And I'm okay with that. I, everybody's right. And, um, and, and that's usually one of the, one of the bigger challenges uh, is the fact that coming to a conversation, just acknowledging, acknowledging that who we're talking to, they're right based on where they're coming from. 
Any questions or thoughts about the six guidelines? Hold on, hold on, hold on. And speak up too. Those are the first thing we just went over. Can yeah. I get clarity on guideline number three as far as an example of what that looks like when you say uh, we can challenge the idea and concept, however, um, not discouraging. I'm, I, I understand what that means as far as not discouraging, but maybe because I don't feel I do it, I can't get an understanding of what that would look like, if that makes sense. An understanding of what, what would look like. So where it says for guide not, guideline number three, we can challenge the idea, concept, or philosophy with questions and thoughts. However, we never engage in intentionally discouraging the remarks remarks or personal attacks. Okay, I'll, I'll make it real simple for you. And we do it all the time, just a lot of different ways. But the most elementary way that we do it, for instance, you saying something and I might have a problem with it, but I might not be able to articulate the problem I have with it. So what I'll do is I'll deflect. And deflection can be something as basic as, well, that's why you got on the funny looking shoes. And it don't even match your outfit anyway. You know, I'm, I'm just saying, and, and then so what happens is because we can't handle the, the conversation verbally, we say intentionally discouraging things to deflect and take the conversation in other directions. That makes sense? Yes, thank you. I was going to say another perfect example of that is, you know what? What you're saying just makes no sense to me. Like, you're crazy. I can't mm. believe you said that. Those are insulting. Those are discouraging. Those mm. are like, what? Even that. Mm. Please. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Because I've done that. So I'm, not <laughs> <laughs> I'm not proud, but I have. And, and that's why I say, microphone. That's why I say intentionally discouraging because you can't help it if you're sharing your thoughts to the best of your ability and somebody decides to be discouraged. That's another thing. But if you're saying stuff with the intent to discourage, we know when we're doing that. And that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm not 100% clear of everything at this point. Moment. I'll, yes, sir. I'll chime in as I come along, but it felt like you're almost indicating that I'm not supposed to agree to disagree. I'm supposed to just flow with the flow because it's being delivered to me by that individual, and and I'm just supposed to jump on board because that individual has has that thought, and I I can't agree to agree with that. Right, <laughs> and, and see, this is the this is the cool thing. What we have to keep in mind is if we have a desire to have what I have defined as a conscious conversation, because we, we, we don't have to participate in a conscious conversation, but when it's a conscious conversation, it's not a matter of agreeing or disagreeing. It's a matter of understanding or not being able to understand. And so, so if, if, uh, if you say, well, we, we just have to agree to disagree. In a conscious conversation, we don't have to do that because I know that's the traditional approach, the thought process of agreeing and disagreeing. And what I'm trying to do in a conscious conversation is totally eliminate that whole agreement, disagreement thing because that's where the whole conflict thing traditionally operates. That's the realm it operates in. So when I'm specifically trying to outline what I call a conscious conversation, I'm saying it's not necessary to agree, it's not necessarily to, to disagree, and it's not necessary to agree to disagree. It's like have, for lack of a better way to describe it, have the courage to say, well, I don't, I don't really understand, I, I just don't get it, and that's okay. Or I do, okay, I understand and leave it. 
See, we can't leave it. We, 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 we can understand what somebody is saying, even if it's not something that flows in our direction. And we can leave it. What I'm, time. hold it, hold it, wait, wait. I'm sorry. We about to be in a fight. <laughs> we about to violate. <laughs> so, <laughs> violate number four, guideline number four. So, <laughs> so, so what I'm trying to do is establish what is called a conscious conversation, and, and that's not needed in a conscious conversation. However, in the regular conversation, the traditional ones that we're watching every day and that's going on, and that's not working very well when we get in a group discussion, uh, we can do that all the time. Yes, sir. I'm still slightly lost because the, the, the term conscious conversation doesn't give me a picture of a subject matter that we would be discussing in a conscious conversation. So if we were picking a subject matter, this empty glass, and we we're all speaking, someone comes to the table maybe with 95% fact of how this glass has become mm -hmm. what we're looking at. In a conscious conversation, from what I'm understanding you say, I'm just supposed to sit back and accept everyone's vision and opinion of this conscious vision that they see, whether, whether they're right or wrong. Don't question it, don't challenge it, just No, I didn't say don't. No. I didn't say don't question a challenge. You can question and challenge. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just, just Go ahead. I'm gonna give it right back, but you kind of like answered his question. He didn't say you can't. It says right here. We, we can challenge the idea, concept, or the philosophy with questions and thoughts. It, it's not like you don't have to ask questions again about what somebody thinking. Challenge them with some questions and thoughts. Just don't say, okay, whatever. Like you said, don't be discriminated. You crazy. Challenge them. If, if, you, if you think, if someone say here and says, that glass is full, if we're having a conscious conversation, from my understanding, I'm late, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, explain to me why you think that glass is full. That's what I want to, I want to know. I'm not going to sit out here and say, oh man, you crazy. And, you know, everybody think you're, no, if you think that glass is 95% full, tell me how you got there. And I think that's what, is that, that's, that's what, the, idea that's what the conscious conversation right, is and about. If you, and if you can convince me, mm -hmm. then I'm with you. Not, not only that, but even if it's not about convincing, it's about me saying, this is why I think that glass is 95% full. And then somebody else can say, I think it's 95% empty. And the, the challenge in a conscious conversation is for us to be able to leave it right there. Because have faith in knowing everybody that's looking at this glass, there are going to be some that see it as 95% empty, and we don't need a hero to speak for all of us. Let the man describe why he think is 95% full or woman, and somebody describe why they think is 95% uh, whatever, and then be, have the ability, the discipline to leave it, and know that everybody else around listening is Operating from their perspective, their understanding. I'm not gonna hog this conversation. <laughs> no, go ahead. Give him the mic. Give him the mic. But it's almost like a contradiction. I'm sorry. You can interview me. No, you can see. It's almost it's almost like an, a contradiction of the the anger that you spoke of having to get over because you had your conscious thought, and maybe the rest of the room wasn't on board with your conscious thought, and you were upset with the fact that your thought was right for you and you thought it was right for everybody. That was 20 years ago. Okay, okay, okay. It's 20 years ago. Okay. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to say, uh, given, I mean, I have like a little bit more clarification based off of some of the conversation that took place. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, when you said, like giving your example about two plus two mm -hmm. equaling four, but someone else says that it equals five, um, I think that some things are absolute. It's not a matter of opinion mm. um, or perspective, um, uh, whatever it may be. And so 
to me, I feel like this could be a teaching moment. And, you know, even if that person still does not take away from the conversation what, you know, might be the absolute, mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I think we have an obligation to say what actually is um, so that, you know, I feel like I would not, I would be doing everyone a, dis a disservice if I just did not speak on uh, certain things that are actually absolutes. And then they're walking around talking to the next person saying the same thing. And maybe that conversation may not go the same way. But I mean, you can't control everything that happens past right. that point but i do feel that we do have a responsibility and an obligation even when you're talking to an adult or a child or whatever to educate right. if you are able but i do believe that there is a way to do that productively and mm -hmm. you know what you've offered here but i don't think we should just say you know yeah you know what you're right and that's the truth i don't believe that mm -hmm. but i think that if you have attempted and that person is not taking it in then at that point then you keep it moving well one of the challenges that and, and what you just described is how it normally goes because there's somebody who feels like, no, I, I can't let you say that. Anybody ever said that to themselves? I can't let you say that. That's not the truth. That, and what I'm saying, because a conscious conversation is a new exercise, this is not, again, a traditional thing. This is not something that this, people are participating in on the regular and then choosing not to. It's, it's not like people have this in their hip pocket and they say, well, I'm choosing not to be in a conscious conversation. This is a new, a new concept. So what I'm saying is in a conscious conversation, if they say it's five, this is not a math class. Now, if they're in a math class, it's different. I can even tell them. If I'm having a conversation with them, I can accept you saying this five, but I'm not sure what they'll say in a math class. But in a, an attempt and have a conscious conversation, if they say it's five, whether they can explain to me or not why they say it's five, it doesn't matter. Okay, that's cool. Now I think it's four, and I explain why I think it's four, and then we move on. Now that concept can be literal, but it can also be a microcosm of a larger type of discussion and a larger subject matter and everything else. Because for the most part in our traditional conversations, we have a problem, even what are called absolutes. There, there was an absolute that Pluto was a planet. And if you didn't write that down on the test, not only was it absolute, it was scientific fact. And if you didn't write that down on the test, you got it wrong. Well, that scientific fact and absolute is no more true. Not only that, but 100 years from now, 90% of what we think is right is going to become obsolete. And it's because there's so much more information and so much that we don't know and so many next levels of understanding. But the challenge for us is, because we start getting locked into our thought process and what you might identify as absolutes, we cut ourselves off from being exposed to all of this other stuff we're not available, or, I mean, not aware of. And so this is the other part of what a conscious conversation is about, because it allows us to leave our mindset and our consciousness open to receive information that we're not familiar with, that we may not understand. But even if we don't understand it, it's OK, because it becomes a dot, an information dot. And then when we get more information dots, all of a sudden, those things come together. And then it begins to make sense to us. So what I'm saying, too, about a conscious conversation is it opens up the opportunity for us to even connect dots later on based on information we were allowed ourselves to receive because we weren't so finite in our thinking and in our understanding of things. So it's, there's a, this, the example of the addition and subtraction is just a small understanding of how a bigger approach to life is in receiving information from the universe and keeping ourselves open to next levels of understanding.
Does that make sense? And so, so yeah, so in here, in a, in a, the other thing about a conscious conversation is everybody doesn't have to be on board. So for instance, my, if my goal is to have a conscious conversation based on these six um, out, outlines, I can have it with anybody. I don't have to have active participation from everybody because my objective is to have a certain energy and certain approach and certain desire to communicate and understand. Yes, sir. So the question I have is, people that approach a conversation with that um, a particular mindset of, uh, do they just want to be right or do they want to understand? And uh, I'm going to let you touch on that. I think that traditionally we want to be right. And that's how it traditionally goes. But that's also why I decided to try to create another approach to having a conversation. Because I'm watching how the conversation goes when people want to be right and identify somebody else as wrong. And especially with our emotional states of mind and how we, you know, depend on what's going on in our lives and everything, you know, right and wrong can just explode in something totally non-productive. One of the things that I always say is if you Google, see right and wrong leads to arguments a lot of times, not all the time. But if you Google argument leads to and hit return, every single day, 365 days a year, you will see new tragedies every single day that started with an argument that escalated to something when both people are emotionally out of control and nobody knew how this thing was going to end. It's like Russian roulette. So the other thing about a conscious conversation is the objective is to diminish the potential for an open conflict and argument that leads to something we don't expect. And that is, it has a better chance of happening when at least one person has their faculties about them. Usually when something tragic happens, it's because both people were emotionally out of control. Any more thoughts about the guidelines? Yes, yes. Okay, so in one of your guidelines, you talked about uh, like passive aggressiveness and how sometimes- uh, Certain things. Yeah, certain things can be uh, passive aggressive, like uh, facial, um, expressions and things like that. And um, what I thought to be very interesting is that um, how some people perceive um, through their eyes what you mean by the way that you're looking. And um, because very often, like I scrunch up my face and things like that if I'm processing something or whatever it may be, and to someone else it could be perceived as me being disrespectful or disagreeing or having an issue with the way they look. I could, I, I, obviously I'm not saying anything at that point, I'm just looking. And um, you know, so I, I guess my thing here is that um, what happens when someone perceives uh, your look as being something that it really does not mean? I'm so glad you asked that question. There's absolutely nothing we can do about how people choose to perceive what we say. When we're speaking in the context of a conscious conversation, we're talking about intent. So if I'm sitting at the table and I act with intent to let them know I am totally disagreeable with what they're saying by my facial expressions or certain body language, that's what we're speaking about. But we can't control people who decide to perceive things however they choose to. We, we have no control over that. So ultimately, it's, it's about our spirit and our energy. And, and if you're doing something with good intentions and you know it from inside you, nothing you can do about people who, try, who decide to perceive it another way. You can't control that. The only opportunity to control anything we have is control ourselves and we have some challenges having some control over us.
meeting our own <laughs> expectations of ourselves. So, yeah, can't do anything about that. Any other thoughts about the guidelines? Yeah. Continuation of what you just said, um, and I was thinking, if, um, if I'm trying to have a conscious conversation, mm -hmm. And you just said everyone in the room doesn't necessarily have to have it. Now, if we, if both you and I are having a conversation mm -hmm. and we're coming from the conscious conversation arena, then I can see where the flow would be easy or less confrontational or anger mm -hmm. or fights or whatever. Because mm -hmm. um, I had a similar situation um, just this week. And I did use the words that you just used. I agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. And that was my way of trying to shut it down because um, I understood we had, you know, mm -hmm. spoke back and forth. And I understood where that person was coming from. And I explained why I thought the way I, I thought. But you saw there was a stalemate. So neither party was going to, I guess, give. So I, I use those words, I agree to disagree. And you're saying that we should just kind of stop. Well, let me ask you a question. Did you understand them? I, yeah, I understood what they were saying. You understood what they were saying. Um, and I totally disagreed. I, I totally disagreed with what they were saying. Because uh, um, they made an analogy that no matter how they put it, I was just like, no, that's just not common sense or whatever. Um, and as a younger individual, not that that's always correct. Younger people can definitely show us a few things too. But um, I was just thinking um, that's a way of walking away and saying, you know, I'm not 100% where you are, but you haven't won, won me over with what you said, so let's agree that we don't agree on this particular topic, but we're not going to get anywhere by continuing maybe a two-day dialogue mm -hmm. trying to get you where I am mm -hmm. at that time. Because I do um, agree that we're all on different levels, and where um, we're going to understand or know things is going to change over a period of time. And you're right, it could be that what that person was saying five years from now, I'll say, oh, I get it. But at this point in time, I had to agree that no, I'm not there yet. So the agree to disagree is, is, is always very interesting. This is not necessarily the truth. This is just my perspective based on my own limited understanding of things. Usually when we agree to disagree, we just want to let a person know, I'd still disagree with you but let's stop talking. That's what it really means. What a lot of times when people say that. And I understand that traditional approach, but I'm trying to separate that from a conscious conversation. So in a conscious conversation, I don't have to announce that I disagree with you by saying, let's just agree to disagree. I, I don't have to do that. All I have to do is say, I, okay, I understand and leave it. And, and I know how difficult that is because that's not how we used to doing things. But at the end of the day, even when we make the announcement, I vehemently disagree with you. Okay. Why? why? Now, if I've already explained why I feel differently, then the disagreement just doesn't matter anymore. What matters is, okay, I understand where you are now. I understand what you're saying. Is there anything about what I said that you didn't understand? Well, I understand you. I just don't agree. That's OK. See, because I'm still, I'm going to have a conscious conversation. If you insist on saying you don't agree, that's on you. That's cool. But I don't have to. I know you disagree with me. I don't disagree with you because I don't have to. I understand where you're coming from. And that's all that matters. Well, for me, one of my favorite things to say is tell me a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. And if I don't agree with you, I would say, I hear you. And that's how I end a conversation. I want to say, I think we're spending a lot of time on the guidelines. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but if we just, if we could move forward with guideline number six in mind, with the mindset that if I agree or don't agree, what you say is right, and I'm trying to get an understanding on what you say being right. Next person, I'm listening with the intent to understand what you're saying is right. The next person, I'm listening with the mindset to understand what you're saying is right. I'm not focused on anything else other than hearing what's coming out the person's mouth with the mindset that what is coming out this person's mouth is right, then I think, and I like, because it is a mental shift, because we, we're not used to listening to people with that mindset that everything that's about to come out this person's mouth is right. We're, we're already on guard. We're trying to negate what they're saying. And so I think if we put this guideline in play on moving forward, that everything that's going to come out the person's mouth is right, then we don't need to disagree. We don't need to agree to disagree. We're like, everything that's coming out of everybody's mouth is right. Right? <laughs> and, 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 and a conscious conversation. <laughs> In a but conscious that's conversation. Before, right, right. right. So. But that's why I, I like to establish that in a conscious conversation. Because what happens is sometimes it get blendy blendy. It's like, well, we kind of veer back to when, when I'm having a conversation, and then I have to say, no, make, we talking about in a conscious conversation. I think it would be helpful mm -hmm. when a person is going off track like that mm -hmm. if we can re revert them back to number six. Well, actually, the reversion is back to number one. The mind is like a fingerprint. There's a reason why we see things differently. Yes. I think I, I don't want to get too more, much more into the guidelines, OK? But I do have a question. I do have a question. And can you legitimately have a conscious conversation when the person you're communicating with does not have these rules? Absolutely. Because I feel like it would be one-sided. And I'll give you an example. Earlier today, someone said something to me, and my response was, okay. And they said, okay. <laughs> what do you mean, okay? Like they were waiting for a rebuttal or a engagement or you know, some kind of a challenge. And I just went, okay. Because I, my mind was like, I hear you. That's your opinion. That's how you feel. I'm, I'm okay with that. And they were trying to pull it into what we're trying to avoid. So I'm wondering, if I don't lay out the ground rules for the people I'm communicating with, can I truly have a interactive, conscious co conversation? Absolutely. By myself? Absolutely. Okay. Because either you can, have a, you can choose to have a conscious conversation, or you can choose to do the traditional thing and argue and fight and agree and disagree. At minimum, I can have a conscious conversation. Now, if I'm talking to somebody that's interested in having one and understanding the, the little guidelines and let's have a true interaction, and, and that will help when the book is out because then you can say, hey, this is another approach to having a conversation. Um, that's different, but we, we, we can always have a conscious conversation. It doesn't matter who, because I'm not, if, if you have a problem with me saying, okay, I understand then that means you want me to fight. <laughs> that, that's, no, I'm not going to do that, right. you know, and it's okay. And, and what the, uh, the, uh, the interesting thing is they'll think about that afterwards. Like, what was that about? I don't, you know, and, and they'll, they'll have to work it out. But we have the choice all times to have a conscious conversation. So what I wanted to put on the table today, and I, I, I needed some answers. Now, I'm not, this is like a handout that I would like for people to leave with. You know, I have my two books for sale, my deck of cards for sale or whatever, but I just wanted somebody to, I, I wanted you all to leave with something that represents my thoughts that you don't have to pay for and uh, that, that shows that I appreciate that you came. And, um, and then I, um, I always had this thing. Sometimes in life, you pick up things along the way, 
and you say, if I ever do something like that, I am not doing that. And I remember I used to go to these workshops and seminars, and people would give me a staple thing of handouts, and you could see half of them have been printed 50,000 times, and they fade, and then they crooked on the page in just any old kind of way. And so I said, well, if I give handouts, let me give them out a certain way. So this is what this is. We're not going to go through this book or anything. I might reference something in it, but it's just for you and to show my appreciation and then also to use those last two pages to take notes if you want to say something without interrupting and you want to remember what you want to say. <laughs> so um, I wanted to put on the table, uh, I had two thoughts specifically relating to like black people in America. And the one thought is we've been fighting for freedom for a really long time. Like I've been hearing about this fight for freedom. And so the question I have is, is ha has anyone defined this freedom that we're fighting for? What is the definition of the freedom that we are reminded that we're supposed to be fighting for every January, Martin Luther King's birthday and the celebration of the Civil Rights Movement? And what is the freedom that we're fighting for? Anybody want to tackle that? Because if I'm going to be in a fight for freedom, I think it's important for us to know what it is we're fighting for. Go ahead, man. I don't know how relevant this is going to connect to your question now, but I've had the question on the table for quite some time of uh, politicians have been out here trying to <clears throat> uh, get the government to approve a reparation bill. Reparations? Reparations. Uh huh. Maybe that's a portion of the freedoms that you're questioning. I stepped back for lack of understanding, and I'm sure it's for lack of understanding. Why is why are we so involved in suggesting that the United States is who we should be reaching out for the reparations versus reaching back to Africa for the reparations if we are supposed to be their lost and stolen children? into slavery. Any mother at this table who loses their children is going to do whatever they can do to get their children returned to them. In my eyes, again, for maybe a lack of understanding, Africa has not done that. Well, I'm going to say this without intent to offend anybody, but just to make a point. A lot of times, mothers on crack don't be reaching back for their kids. And when you look at the history of what has gone on in Africa and trust, Europeans were colonizing Africans long before we got on the scene here. So a lot of times, we forget that just because they're in Africa and they're connected with certain traditions and understandings, that they've been just as damaged as we are, if not more. So to expect the mother on crack to reach back and look for their kids, this, I don't think it's realistic. That's just a perspective. I think that would be the identification of what I would be reaching for as a freedom. If I could honestly identify the fingerprint of where I belong mm -hmm. in the history of Africa. I can't identify that at this point. We're, all, we're all told that we come from kings and queens. I can't identify with the fingerprint. Um, so first, uh, I want to clarify that we were already here. Um, and. Uh, you know, I, I find it very difficult when I'm uh, engaging in life 
in general when I'm looking at different things, whether it be social media or any type of media, and feeling like I need to be a part of whatever is taking place. Um, you know, I don't feel the need to march. I don't feel the need to jump on board when the media has decided to highlight the next person that has been um, murdered or treated poorly or whatever it may be because to me, to have it dictated to me about what I should see and how I should see it, um, to me is not freedom. Um, freedom to me and uh, the reasons why I basically choose, chose my business to focus on wellness, uh, to focus on strengthening emotional intelligence, to focus on um, having mastery of self is because I want people to understand that when we care for ourselves and we know who we are, that ultimately that is freedom, when you're always seeking information. So, I mean, I, I do know, I, I just don't have a desire to respond to things within a, para, a, a paradigm that was basically given to us for which we should see the rest of the world and see ourselves. Um, so. You know, I, I, I'm not really sure what people are really fighting for, but for me, like I said, freedom for me is a mastery of self and being my best self, being kind um, to people, being loving, being loved each and every day, whether that means removing myself from someone or, you know, but I, I just don't choose to partake in politics and, and things of that sort because to me that's not what freedom, that's not where it really lies, or the answer. Freedom, anybody else want to tackle freedom? What is freedom? What is the freedom that we're supposed to be allegedly fighting for here in America? And I say where, I'm talking about um, so-called African Americans, black folks, whatever, born here. For me, I think that when it comes to freedom, in the traditional stance that we understand freedom, um, it's what Martin Luther King did. You know, let's march and um, we'll be free <laughs> um, without any foundation or basis. Um, Actually, the back of it is the word. So, freedom, what, from what we understand, it, is just the traditional, mm. you know, what people call the struggle. Um, and that is a challenge for me because I don't see how marching is freeing anybody. What do you think freedom is? Um, my personal take on freedom is more inward, internal. If you're, if you're free, act like you're free. Uh, um, if you're not in chains, you're not bound, I think you're free. Um, you can free yourself. So, and you can't put anybody over you. When, you. when you say I'm not free, and that means you're looking at everything like somebody's over you. Somebody's tying you down when you're not tied down. So, um, freedom to me is more internal, not external. Uh, for me, freedom is, is a mindset, um, letting go of looking for permission outside of, of self, letting go of the dependency of striving for things that were defined for you to strive for other than your basic living necessities. And then everything else beyond the necessities is, is a bonus. But the freedom to have what you need to live on a day-to-day -day basis is freedom. And um, 
not looking for someone to come save you for the things that you need. So in the spirit of what we're here to do, I, I just want to say I hear you and I, I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying and I understand what you're saying as well as you. And if it's okay, I'd like to piggyback on it because I've lately been going through the quest for freedom from seeking approval from other people. Um, there are things that I've attempted to do that um, people have been guarding that development to kind of monitor that development and I feel like I am almost held hostage to their opinion of how I'm doing. And so I've taken the, the, the I've made the decision lately to keep it to myself. Whether it comes to fruition or not, I know. And I don't have to worry about what do you think of what I've done or not done. Because I felt like a lot of times I would do things and automatically I would think, well, let me call somebody and talk about what I'm doing. That has been like a shackle. So to get to the point of self-mastery, to use that word, um, self-appreciation, um, um, self-respect, I, I can figure it out. I have the tools to figure it out. I don't need you to help guide me. And I know sometimes we need people as a sounding board, but there was something beyond that that I received. And to get to a place where I'm like, I'm good. I'll figure it out and I'm whatever, fall, rise, whatever, I'll be okay. That's been freedom for me. So when, um, when I think about freedom, I think that we have like personal freedom. I think that's what a lot of us are talking about. And then I think about, um, I, I, I'm like a we person, you know, so I think about freedom for us in the sense of, um, of those of us. So it's, I'm like, I feel like it's not enough just for me to be free. I, I would be, um, because at the end of the day, in my mind, it's usually like lonely. So if I got all this personal freedom and I can, like I, I feel like I operate, I, I talk about like my world, right? I operate in a world that I feel like I created. So I wanna be around certain people and these are the people, but in my world, I want my people to be free too. So like if I wanna get up and go do something, I want my people to go get up and do it too. And so for me, I'm always um, interested in how do we, I'm not, I'm not so much, um, I'm more interested in, and I'm not saying everybody, I, I'm not, I don't know if I can speak for all of black people what I'm saying, but, but I'm saying in the world that I operate in, I'm saying like, you know, this little Hartford, whatever world that I operate in, I just feel like it, it, it would be so much um, more interesting if, if everybody could find their freedom that they're looking for. And so, and, and have the, um, the knowledge or the, the, yeah, I guess it's the, the knowledge to be able to realize that they do have that potential inside of them and can, can do it because um, every, I, I, I get consumed sometimes with, you know, so you do see the stuff on television, you know, uh, another young brother gets shot. And so in some ways in my mind, I say, well, that could not be me. But on the other side of my mind, I'm saying that could be me just like, so as, as free as I am, as educated as I am, as all of these things that I'm supposed to be, a police officer could shoot me today, just like one of these young brothers that live right, right in this neighborhood. And so, and that's not supposed to happen because I'm free. And so I feel like until we get to the place where it's, um, it's the it's it's a different sameness, a different sameness in like that because because I feel like you know um, we get caught up with um, wanting wanting to have a consequence. So something bad happens, and now we want a consequence for that bad thing for the person that did something bad. But I feel like I'm not satisfied. Like it, I, I'm not I don't feel good about the idea that as much as we just talked about freedom and. I'm not speaking for anybody else, but even because I agree with everything y'all said in my mind, but I'm saying, but it could all be like, boom, done, just like that. 
And for me, so that that's that's unacceptable for me when I think about freedom. just say before I hand it to you that freedom for me is really not being defined or confined by the system and also reaching out to free others so I definitely agree with that as well because until we're all free none of us are free because they look at us all as the same thank you um, as I was listening to your comment um, I've been really intrigued about what I call the, the spirit of Harriet Tubman. The and what? Say that again. I've been really intrigued about what I call the spirit of Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. Oh, the spirit of Harriet Tubman. And once she became free, she went back to free other slaves. But she herself had to know the blueprint, the path, the way to, to freedom. And from my understanding and, and reading her story, she had a team of people who were all on the same frequency and vibration for that mission to be carried out. And so there's a law that sometimes we want more for others than they want for themselves. And so that we sometimes can have a glitch in the system because I don't know how true it is. I just heard this part of the story that if Harriet Tubman had you on that path and you made noise or something that would give everyone else away. I don't know how true it is, but I was just told she would shoot you on sight. Yeah. Because now the we is compromised. And so when we're, when we're talking about freedom, we is a great concept and idea, but you can't save people who don't want to be saved. And so we have to also play keep that into consideration as, as well. Um, so the spirit of Harriet Tubman, I, I like to use as a guide because she, she of all people definitely wanted freedom for, for all people. And even in her journey and her time, it, it didn't always work out that way. And, and that is true. There are some people that don't want to be saved, but for me, just even planting the seed could be enough. Um, I believe that freedom as well is um, stop comparing ourselves to white people or um, in alignment with what they think or what they feel about who we are and what we should be and you know these things and for me because i think it is kind of like hard for us sometimes to know what our culture is because we were born here in america um and you know we look at other uh, people that are black from other places and be like, wow, they have their own foods, they have their own this, they have their own that, their own language, and uh, all of these things. But, you know, I, I, I really believe that once we stop allowing for white people to dictate who we are and we begin to develop that for ourselves separate from what their ideas are, um, that will be in a much better place. And I, um, like the gentleman down at the end, you were talking about Martin Luther King, and I truly believe that um, a lot of our downfall as a people came during the civil rights era when we were um, trying to be um, included in what white people were doing and um, their education. So now we see our children being miseducated and we're upset about it. And um, so I, I really believe that, like I said, we need to take a step back. And I mean, I'm grateful for Kwanzaa, you know, but at the same time, I think it's greater than that. I think it's, it's bigger than that. And I think we do need to learn how to build outside of what are the confines that white people have created for us, the, the paradigm for which we see ourselves and others. I can uh, slightly piggyback on what you said because I agree with what you said, but I kind of have had the thought that 
maybe Martin Luther King's drive to have us free might have been a slight portion of our downfall because it didn't come with a, a rule book. We all had an idea of what we were wanting to be free of. We wanted equal opportunity, we wanted equal housing, equal this, equal that, equal that. And everything that we wanted to equal of was pretty much in that white community. And we didn't think that we were uh, fairly being issued our freedoms. So as we had the opportunity to have some of those and take advantage of it, we didn't really take advantage of it collectively as a group, so we kind of mismanaged it in some respects. But the freedoms were, were accomplished in some respects as well. I'm going to uh, refrain from saying I agree to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> but what I will say is that we don't need white people for anything. You know, there, when this day is done, there are going to be a lot of folks who don't even understand how to survive. If all of these things that we have right now, the lights is gone, the hot water is gone, you are not going to know what you need to do. And I believe that we are being duped by the system and we are not learning universal laws. We are not learning um, the importance of uh, how to be prepared and survive without some of the things that we have. We're looking to say, oh, you know, what we really need is wealth. There will come a day, I believe, where wealth will get you nothing. You know, and your knowledge and your ability to think and understand people and how they think and how they respond to things is really what it's going to come down to. And yes, if we have gold and things, we need to, I, I believe we need to educate ourselves on what real value is and that's something that like i said we're not being taught in school so like i said i won't say i agree to disagree but i will just say i understand and you know let my statement stand as true for me freedom for me, is just being able to be where I want to be, when I want to be, how I want to be, if I want to be, do what I want, when I want, how I want. Um, I see like the penal system as what freedom is not. Um, and for um, maybe a great part of it too, even the way we're living day to day. So I don't think we're at perfect freedom right now, but if I had to define what freedom would be for me, it would be that. Um, I guess I have um, also, I've, I've lived here in Connecticut for about 50 years, roughly. Before then, I lived in England, so I saw um, how people were treated there, people of color. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about having your own language and not having your own language or having your culture or not having your culture, and coming here and I see, there was, there was a difference, but I still see a lot of the same. Um, and also from my family being from the islands and living there, I was spending a lot of time there. So um, I think, as you, you said, black people were here already, but they were everywhere. Exactly. Um, and when you say, a language, we've all adapted languages along the way because there are black people in Latino or Hispanic speaking countries, so they're there. Um, if you look at the Chinese, you'll see that the original <laughs> originals there were also people from Africa or black people. So we're all of it, we're all of it. And the, lang the way languages developed and all of that, I just think we're all of it. Um, and we should not restrict ourselves to say 
well, they have that culture. That just so happens to be the way they were raised in that part of the world. Um, I don't think it comes down to a race, even though that's what we've been fed. It's like, well, the Chinese do this, and the Indians do that, and so forth and so on, but it's all of us. It's just where you so happen to be um, in the universe. So again, for me, it's being able to speak the way I want to, if I want to speak Spanish, French, English, whatever, just being able to do what I want, where I want, how I want, whether it's the educational system, you know, going to the high schools that are in public education or not, just doing it because I want to do it and not because someone says that's the way it should be done or how it should be done. Anybody else? <clears throat> I um, just want to add one thing about freedom, and I just sent you the, the link on it. I, we'll send it to everybody else, but the link that I sent um, was a video of a young boy on an island. I don't know what island it was, but in the video, he gets up, he picks a coconut off the tree, he opens the coconut with his bare skilled hands on how they know how to open up coconuts, which I don't know how to do that, so I'm watching this. And then he has his food from the tree. After he eats his fresh fruit from the tree, he uses the coconut as a trap for fish. Then he gets twigs from the tree, catches the worms, put them in the coconut, and then solders the coconut back together and drops it in the water and goes about his day. And then he comes back and there's a bunch of fish that gravitated into the worms, into the coconut. And I'm watching this and I'm like, he ain't gotta go to work. <laughs> <laughs> he got food on the tree. <laughs> he know how to put stuff together and build stuff with his own. To me, that was like, I wanna go there. Like, because the food, the clothing, I mean, they were what we would consider not matching, but he was happy. He was happy and free. And we just, I feel, been given a false description and definition on what freedom is. You know, so I just, I shared that link with Alfonso. He has everyone's information if he wants to share it with you guys. But that let video I just sent is what freedom looks like to me. Can you pass that, make sure everybody put their name on it, the email address, who, who if, if somebody didn't? Anybody else want to address freedom? Because of course I have a perspective on freedom. Um, I, I look at my understanding of freedom as like this, a universal understanding of freedom. So I don't believe that we can go anywhere in the universe and just do what we want when we want, how we feel like it. Like, if you go out into outer space and you ain't got no oxygen or you take that helmet off, you just can't take it off because you feel like it. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's no place that we can exist where we can just do what we want anytime we feel like it when we want. But Everywhere we exist, we can assess how that reality works and functions, just like the guy you just talked about did. Assess how, how everything works. And then based on our assessment, decide what we want from it. That's very important, because if we don't know what we want, then the only thing we can do is be servants to somebody else's needs and desires. That's it. No matter what environment we're in. So we assess the reality, we develop an understanding of how it works, the best way we know how, no matter what that reality is, we decide what we want, and then we figure out how to make that reality serve our best interests. To me, that's the foundation for freedom. Because a person can be in prison and confined in a cell 23 hours a day and can be free. 
He can assess that reality of that environment here. The key word is reality. You can't be in denial about the reality. Every day on Facebook, black people are making comparisons. She only got 10 years. He got 48 years for killing a dog. We, they got this, we got that. They got this, we got that. This is how this country has always been. The, the, the comparisons are a confirmation of denial. When you operate in any reality from a place of denial, you set yourself up to constantly be hurt. So the guy in prison, he looks at it, okay, this is it for life, 23 hours in the cell. What, how does this thing work? Can I paint? Can I read? Can I write? Can I get on the internet? What can I do? based on this reality. Okay, now assess this reality. Okay, I could paint, I could read, I could write, I can send mail out, I could do this. Cool. This is how this reality works. Okay, now I, this is what I want from it. I want to do my poetry, I want to paint. I want to exercise. And then, okay, based on how this works, what I want, how do I make this reality serve me? Freedom is operating, in operation. You can drop me in a rice field in Taiwan and I'm going to use this universal approach to life. I'm going to say, okay, how does the reality work? All right, I'm in this rice field. Don't nobody look like me and I don't know what I'm doing here. And I'm watching how this is. Somebody speak English? How does this thing work? Okay, now based on what I understand and how it works, what do I want? I want to get back to something familiar to me, to Hartford. So now based on this understanding, and I know what I want, now my, my, it's my responsibility to now figure out how to make this reality serve me. If we're in the forest, there's lions and tigers and bears, things that will kill us every day, intentionally and unintentionally. If we don't understand certain berries are poisonous, we're going to die. You just can't run around eating any kind of berries talking about that's how you exercise your freedom. Because you will die. You can't just, if you're a three-year-old, start playing with a, a baby tiger cub, and you don't have the wherewithal to understand that that mother is nearby, and that mother comes and rips your three-year-old in half. And like here in America, they go hunting for the mother who ripped the three-year-old in half and then kill the mother like, no, that, that's living in denial. If, if you don't come out of that understanding that if you see any kind of cub, any animal, it's your best, you need to move out the area. In life, no matter where we go, there are written rules and there are understood rules. And we gonna, if we don't know what they are, we're going to either learn what they are or we're going to die, period. For me, America is just another force. There are people who are out to kill us every day. That's just reality about this thing. There's how, that how this system works. See, the, the way I look around here in this reality, the, I can spend my entire life worried about driving and getting, and, and getting murdered because that's the reality of this thing, but that's not how I, I choose to live. So I understand this reality the way it is. I assess it. The other part of how I see this reality and freedom in America is I kind of remove myself from this race-based thinking as much as possible. Because everybody and everything here can serve me. I just have to know what I want. In every relationship we're in, if we ever feel used, it's only because we went into the interaction not knowing what we wanted. They knew what they wanted. And they didn't use you. You felt used because you didn't know what you wanted out of the interaction. That's just a perspective. It's not necessarily the truth. So. When I look at this thing, freedom from a universal place, it's just a basic universal approach. Understand the reality that we're in to the best of our ability and reality. You can't be in denial.
decide what we want from that reality, and then figure out how to make that reality serve us. We struggle because the civil rights movement taught us that our standard for what is best for us and freedom is white people and what they are or aren't doing. So when we look on social media, it's, you cannot look without us complaining about white people. And it's, it's almost like complaining about birds that fly. See, 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 that bird used its wings to fly again. Okay, you haven't figured out that that's what birds do. I'm good. I, I, I'm not going to beef with you about it. But I do know it won't be in my best interest to be interacting with you when it comes to understanding the nature of things. Because you haven't figured out the nature of birds. If I believe in racism, and, and, and uh, you know, I've, I've gotten smashed for this constantly, and it's okay. In order for me to believe in racism, then I have to ignore the reality of our historical relationship with white people. And I say white people in general, and I'm comfortable with generalizing, because white people always challenge me on that. I'm comfortable with generalizing because white people showed me what they do when they get upset if something goes down they don't like during, the, for instance, the O.J. Simpson case. When they didn't like that verdict, I learned how they behave when something goes down that they don't like. And I'm talking about a nation of white people. So once you showed me that, and now I see a police officer shoot a man in the back five times that's running away, and I don't see the same outrage, you cool with that. It's, it's fair for me to understand that, in general, you've accept you're OK with that. Because you showed me outrage when you think something that happened ain't right. So I'm comfortable with the generalization that the nature, what we're watching is the nature of the behavior of white people when it comes to our interaction with them. This is the only way I can explain it. No matter how far back I go in history, I can't find any other behavior. This is how it's always been. So now, if you try to teach me that that's racism, then you're also trying to teach me that when birds fly, that's birdism. <laughs> if you want me to come to a meeting to resolve racism, then you're trying to get me to come to a meeting to talk about how we can stop birds from using their wings. Now, I'm, that's, that's not sexy to me. I'm not attending that meeting. So we have to, when we're assessing our situation, we have to deal with reality. If we do not deal with reality, it, it throws everything out of whack. And so when, Martin, when the Civil Rights Movement taught us that white people were our standard, and that our understanding of freedom is to be equal to them. That was a continuation of, of a certain amount of insanity. Um, that's just a perspective, it's not necessarily the truth. I have to always say that. Because it never makes sense to want to be equal to anybody on any level for any reason, ever. We are all brought into this universe with our own assignment. And if I'm over there looking at yours, trying to be equal to yours, then I'm missing my own assignment. And the only thing I can do is be of service to you, because you on top of your assignment. That's it. So in our demand for freedom, we confirmed that we were out of our natural minds because our demand never included we want to reconnect with our universal foundation historical cultural spiritual foundation that we come from and it's not running around in africa doing african dances and playing the drums it's, it's about the essence the foundation that allowed a country uh, 54 countries to have thousands of different languages and different ways of life but the foundation they moved from was universal laws principles and understanding 
And that's what it's really about. It's not, and, but the other thing I have to say is if I take a bird's eye view and I look at Switzerland, don't nobody there look like me. And I look over there in some of these other places. And then when I look at Africa, I look very familiar to a lot of those people there, just in general. And when I look at Brazil historically, I look familiar to a lot of people. When I look at Australia historically, I look familiar to a lot of people there. So I don't have to do, you know, DNA and blood tests to find out what specific area I'm from. I know at one point this was allegedly identified as Pangaea, which is one land mass. And before it broke up, we traveled out from that central location identified today as Africa and moved throughout the world. And, and that represented the foundation of, you know, allegedly all peoples today. And that's just one philosophy, um, one thought process as that relates to how it happened. So ultimately, again, when I think of freedom, I have to go, always go back to um, removing ourselves from this equality thing and fighting for equality and also needing to celebrate the first black. Any time we celebrate the first black, we confirm that white people are our standard. That's just, those two things can't, they, they exist together all, all time. If I celebrate the first black, white people are my standard. I don't know, can anybody see that any other way? Anybody? Because, okay, so I think, um, so when I think of freedom, that's what I think about. I think about understanding reality when, no matter what it is, where we are. It could be the forest, it could be out of space, it could be America. We can use this approach on our jobs. How does this reality work? So many of us, get jacked up on our jobs because we get taken out of our purpose for being there. How does this reality work? What do I want from it? How do I make this reality serve me? And if that reality is not serving you, have the courage to make a move. Because you ain't going to go in somebody else's house and make it get adjusted for your presence. Even if you have certain rights, even if we have certain rights, at the end of the day, we're going to lose in somebody else's house. You can't nobody just come in your house and kick their shoes off and rub their toes together and go in the refrigerator. It's just not happening. It just doesn't work like that. So when, when we realize it's not working, we got to have the courage to make a move and make it happen for ourselves and not try to keep forcing the world to adjust to what we need and to our comforts and to what, what we desire reality to be. So. That's, that's where I am on the, on the whole uh, freedom thing. And I'm not condemning the civil rights movement. I'm understanding it because I have the ability to look back and learn from it and assess what they got, what they did that makes sense and, and what they did that didn't make sense. And how can we move from there? Because we can't fight the constant reinforcement that that's what was best for us because we don't control it but we can't understand it for ourselves and, and make moves that make sense. Anybody else? Now, I have another question for y'all. In this climate of conflict and confrontation, what do you think about young people being introduced to conscious conversations, to, um, to this approach to having an interaction. Um, high school students, college students, young people. What, what do y'all think about it? I'm just gonna say in advance that I'm gonna listen on this one because the experience that I've had with these millennials, as far as them having any consciousness, I am <laughs> going to listen to what everybody else have to say. Because <laughs> I don't, I, whew, these millennials are just a whole nother entity. It's like a whole nother spirit that 
just doesn't the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree doesn't exist anymore i like these millennials are totally i have no clue how to connect with them um so i'm gonna listen to what everybody else have to say about consciously getting their minds to be open enough to receive how to have a conscious conversation and i don't work in the school system so for those who do As a public school teacher, we have to be very careful what we say and what we tell children. Um, I have been a third grade teacher for 20 years, and that's where I start. I start with my third grade students, and I am from the inner cities of Patterson, New Jersey. Love, 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 love my city. I love my reality, and I am who I am, and no one can change me. And I tell my students, when we turn on a YouTube video, you don't see us on there. You see a white teacher with white kids and they're sitting there. So I said, when these people come in to tape us, let's show them what we can do. They're telling us that we can't read, we can't learn, that we are the scum of the earth. So let's show them who we really are. So when this company came in to take my classroom, had the worst of the worst kids, and someone said to me, well, what did you do to bribe them to sit quietly? I don't bribe my children. These are my children in my city. All my kids are my children. That's how, I don't say my students, they're my children. And when we looked back at the video and I went back and I told my kids, I said, listen, they thought I gave you candy or something to sit you. They don't believe that we can sit quietly? No. So I think it starts with us, those of us who are in the school system, where we have to take a stand and teach our children that they are something special because they don't know that. They really don't know that. And shame on us, and I put me in that category, for not being the person that does that. But I think that's where it starts, where they have to learn it from someone. And they have to learn it from someone that looks like them. Someone that they see walking the streets of their city. Someone whose family is there. I used to throw parties at my house for my kids. And I was told, you can't bring them to your house. You don't have parties. Yes, we do. We have parties. We have barbecues, we have cookouts, and they're gonna come, and their, their parents are gonna come with their brown bags because we are a family. And I want them to know that I am no different from them. If I can do it, you can do it. My niece was shot dead, my brother was shot in the head, my sister had nine kids, she was a crackhead, my daughter is a transgender. I am who you are, I'm no different than you. I just went to school and I got an education and I deal with my reality. And I thank you for being that type of teacher. I did have those teachers and, and you're right and you remind me of Ms. Brown. <laughs> about where you're at, because you said, I'm gonna listen because I feel like the millennials are really just an entity all of their own. And do you believe there's no hope for the young people of today? That they are so ingrained in maybe social media, for example, I'm just throwing that out there, that they can't be, they can't see things differently? No, I don't believe there is no hope. I do believe there is hope, but I can, I'm a huge, um, experience. I can only go based on what I've been um, I exposed to. And so I have to venture out to different um, events or venues to, to see a different type of millennial that has the mindset to strive for greater. Um, but if I don't take myself out of the norm and look outside of my immediate environment, the millennials that I'm exposed to, um, they're, they're not there mentally. 
And so I'm, I will say I'm fortunate because I had teachers like this woman right here, Miss um, Brown, or my math teacher, um, you know, or my uh, English teacher. And they were black females or black men. And they cared about the students. We, I still remember, and I, I love math and science and biology and chemistry, so I'm, a, I'm more of a numbers person. Um, but I remember in math class where, where you had students who didn't understand math, as, as a class collection, I was one of those who I love math, so he would pair me with students that didn't understand math. And as a, as a team in the classroom, then the classroom all got on one understanding of math. And I remember Stacy Lawson, because he was the football, the basketball star, and if you didn't have the grades, you would get kicked out of the team. And I remember working with Stacy because back then it wasn't smart or unintelligent. It was everyone helped each other get to that level of understanding. And so I remember Stacy, who struggled in math, jumping up saying, oh my God, I get it, now I understand it, because the teacher in that classroom made sure that every student got it no matter what and what was important that I remember that doesn't happen now. Those teachers back then had more than one teaching style. And so if his students in the classroom didn't get it this way, he had another way of reaching that student. And what I'm hearing is that teachers now, they only have one teaching style. And if you don't get it the way we teach you, then you're considered, you know, not smart. Which it's, I come from the law of, it's not the student's fault that the teacher didn't get it, it's the teacher's fault. That's where I come from. And so, right now, there's a lot of students who feel as if they're not intelligent or they're not smart because they don't know that it's really the teacher, it's not, not them. So I don't, I don't feel there's no hope, I just feel that they don't know. Not to dominate, but. <laughs> but to dominate. <laughs> um, absolutely, I understand what you're saying, and I think that it has to start somewhere to the point of there's been a style, maybe one particular style, but I think you don't know what you don't know. And these young people, you say, they're not with it. They're not really, they're not really ready. Or because they don't know. I don't what think do it's been introduced. In but that's what you need. I think you, don't, you need people to say, I'm gonna bring a revolutionary approach to your, to your classroom. I'm gonna take the time to say, I know this is usually how we have these little exchanges, but you know what? Let's try it differently. Let's try this and see how it works. So I think, to your question, what do you think about young people incorporating or embracing a conscious conversation approach? Let's bring it in there and try it out. I think it could work, but they don't have it. It's not been introduced. It's not something that they're accustomed to. They're, they're not seeing it at home. They're not seeing it amongst their friends. So it is the responsibility of, of us as parents, as caregivers, as educators to say, let's try this differently and see where it goes. I don't think it could hurt. I, I just want to be clear. I think it's great. But I do have clients in, in my office who are teachers. And literally, I'm listening to her argue with her superiors about trying to get kids to identify themselves with which color crayon they represent. And I'm like, why is this even a topic of conversation in third grade where you're trying to get black kids to identify themselves to what shade color crayon? Like this is really a conversation in, in the school system? So how do we go from that kind of curriculum that a, the that a Board of Education is allowing to having a conscious conversation to self, you know what I'm saying? So there's, there's what we want, I think it's great, but then there's a block on a Board of Education that's really, when it comes to our kids, really don't want them on that higher frequency. It's great, 
I, w I would love to see it there, but there is a board of education that really does not want our children on a higher frequency. And that's the piece that we can't let the school system be the reason that we don't reach our kids. So what if we don't get in the school system? How do we get our kids on a higher frequency regardless of the school system? So I, 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 I'm not saying there's no hope, but I am saying that there has to be a seed planted where I can identify with a Miss Brown or this young lady here that represents me, that I can be great, that I can be something other than what I've seen on, on TV. So yeah, I do agree that there is. <laughs> well, I am an educator and I am in, in it. Uh, I teach teenagers in Georgia. And I wanna say kudos to you for being that type of teacher that connects with her students, because that's what's important. You have to connect with them and they have to know that you, you see yourself as them. I think a lot of teachers feel disempowered. I think um, a lot of teachers don't think they, they don't understand the autonomy and the power that they really have. And a lot of times when I'm talking to my peers and my colleagues, it, you know, it's kind of like you have to have a, a dual mindset that when you, because when you go in there, it's you and those students. But you have to be able to um, be creative enough to, you know, their mandates, their checklists. Because a lot of what they ask you to do is not that deep. And it's not that challenging, but you know how uh, we create stress in our minds. We live in our minds, so we make it a lot worse than it is. But it, it takes a teacher to be able to say, you know, I can do this checklist because it's everything's standards based now. So if you can say, I'm doing standard, um, we got to be able to determine theme in the story. If you can make that connection and be creative, which you can. Now I'm a language arts teacher, so we tend to be more creative. So I can make anything work and connect. And I have used some of the, you know, I'm about teaching them how to listen and have conversations. And it is possible, but consistency. You have to be consistent. Uh, you have to um, connect what you're doing to their lives. You have to make it seem like what they're doing is relevant. And you just, you have to really want to be there. And I do have some colleagues that are in it because they want to be there. And some that I think started out that way, but they get discouraged because of the blockages. So you, you got to have uh, teachers like, her and myself, you know, I'm at the tail end of my career, but you, you have to have teachers that are like, you know, we're here because we love young people and we want to connect. And if you have that at the foundation, then you can make that work. You can make the conscious conversation, but it is consistency. And then you might have a Miss Brown here, and you get next door and you got Miss Smith, and she's just writing something on the board and sitting down. And, and that's, the, 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 that's public school. You don't really have control over that. So, you know, when you send your kids to public school, it's like rolling the dice. You know, you, you hope you get a Miss Brown, but you may not always have a Miss Brown. So it is possible, but you have to have people in there that are in it because they love young people and they want to connect. And, you know, we know how the world is. You have people like that and then you don't. So. I'm the parent, or we are the parent that sends you a child slightly prepared for what we're looking for, for our child. Uh, and I just spoke with this young lady earlier in reference to having been a hands-on uh, grandfather versus, oh, you should, have, you should have seen what Johnny did today and mother saw everything that Johnny did and mother had the opportunity to offer Johnny the ABCs and what have you. I've, I've had the fortune of being a hands-on grandfather and seeing child development. So working with what I'm looking for in the best interest of my children makes it easier for you when you receive my child. And then I'm more particular about you if you're not on the same plane that I'm looking for my child to be on. Uh, we're, very, we're very involved in the school system that our children have gone to. And I must, I can knock on wood for four out of four. They all had the proper tools to be somebody. What they did with them at certain journeys in their life came back to, I don't understand how the heck you got there. Because <laughs> it wasn't taught at home. So seeing kids out in the, in the street, shopping, plazas, 
playgrounds, what have you, with a parent that talks to them in an adult negative form and allows them to carry out that way, that's where you're, you're coming in contact with that child that you don't, that millennium that you don't understand. I was walking into a Chinese restaurant about three weeks ago and the, the mother and father had, I, I assume it was the mother and father, had just exited the, the, the store and the kid had to have been possibly no more than five at that. And the child, I, w I, w I wasn't in ear sight, but I heard the mother repeat to the father that was on site, did you hear what she said? It's damn hot in there. <laughs> the child was not of age to be having that kind of language. But it's like the mother reinforced, wow, I'm proud of you that you said, it's damn hot in there. So it, it starts at home for what we, what we send to you to, to, to enforce what we're looking for. As it pertains to um, if the I think that kids in a high school or college could do a conscious conversation. I think this was a good example of you gave us a framework, um, and I think that students have the capability to take a framework and to be able with some guidance would be able to have a conscious conversation. So framework, uh, the guidelines, the topics, and then maybe some reminders on when they veer off of the guidelines, but I don't. I think it would be a good tool because I think when we started, some of us were in the mindset of like, well, you know, I don't know where you're going with this, but I think that ultimately the thing that happens is is that we just stay within our, in, inside the guidelines, and I think it's a good tool for having a conversation where you, you, you stay within a framework and are able to c communicate without, um, having an argument or other, whatever other rules were set up. So I think it would be a good tool for both of those, uh, uh, you know, high school students and college students because it allows for them to operate within a framework of a, of a discussion, so. So uh, just to piggyback on what you said, uh, and also, first of all, thank you, teacher. Uh, thank you, teacher. And I'm an educator also. Um, so I agree with everything you said. But the question was about can millennials or young people, I think absolutely. Mm. I think, honestly, I think this is what they're looking for. They're actually looking for something different because they've been doing things a certain way and it hasn't been successful um, when they communicate, you know, with each other or when they're taught how to be even in the political circles. That kind of conversation hasn't worked for our children. I think having conversations like this and you have understood guidelines, I think it could work. And real quickly, um, go back to, you said the millenniums. Now you gotta think about where you were at 21, 22, and where were your consciousness? Because I know where I was. And if someone was to come to me and try to educate me about certain, well, I'm a little different, but you know, mm -hmm. we go back a long, long time, but we had people when we were in our 20s mm -hmm. that said we couldn't go sit down, we'd sit at a butt, bookstore for hours mm. and be around this so for us this is nothing we've been doing this for a long time having courageous conversations mm. but I guess it's important for us to go back and find that next group of young people that's mm. just like us you know all different economic levels educational levels to have these conversations to do it in this manner and have the, the, the things we want to talk about laid out I think it'd be beautiful Mm -hmm. And I think that's something we should strive for. I have to leave, but thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Let me know when we can continue and uh, what's the next step. Yes, I sir. That's something. And if we can, I don't know how you want to do this, but I think, I think when we lay down the guidelines, if, you're, if you want to do this, we could do this. Now, we could have sat here and bickered over these six things left and then got nothing done but you brought the right people here together who can figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to expand it. Mm -hmm. You know, bring someone who you know can, can help elevate the conversation, also just expand the knowledge base, because mm -hmm. we gotta get this information out to our people um, as soon as possible. Thank you, for, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming through, my brother. All right, yes sir. Yes, sir. Um, in response to your question, yes. 
Um, I think it would be very helpful. I see it as another tool. Um, not everyone's going to gravitate to it, and not everyone's going to be able to take it and use it the way they should. But I don't think anything taught in school is accepted because, as you said, we're all different. Um, it's not everyone's not going to be able to take it and do with it. But that should not stop it from being a part of the curriculum. Um, I don't necessarily think we need to wait till high school. I think even earlier, it, it would be helpful even earlier. And I think the earlier the better, because then you can continually practice and get better. So that's it. One of the things I've learned <clears throat> about human behavior is anytime something new and unfamiliar is introduced, especially when it challenges how we normally function, there's always going to be pushback. You know, that's just standard procedure. It, it's, it's just real because it's, it's, it's innate. It's our nature to first reject it before we even start trying to hear it out because it's just a, kind of almost like a knee-jerk reaction. But yeah, I um, uh, ultimately would like to definitely um, share with young people now, share with young people, whether it's an elementary, high school, or college age people, doesn't necessarily mean share in the institutions. Right. You know, it's just like come here and you create your own environment. You don't have to go by anybody's rules or anybody's standards. And part of the next approach, or what I call the next private conversation, I would like to have people that came today and maybe even others come and bring some a young person with them and participate in the conversation and go over the guidelines and then have a conversation and have deal with some topics or thoughts that things that that are on their mind you know and um and see what they're thinking because most, a lot of young people today are just rejecting everything. Young people today, you can't tell them to do something that they've watched all their life didn't work for you. If you telling them to go to church and pray and, and this is going to be whatever, whatever, and they've watched you just suffer your whole life and watched you pray and it wasn't working and just watched you in pain and all that, they're just rejecting it. They're not accepting, even, and they're, they're like, I just go on my own and figure it out. But you can't just tell me to do something that I've watched not work for you your whole life. It's not happening. So um, I think a lot of them, you know, are open. It's not just like uh, teenagers but older kids and younger kids are open to receive something different if it's introduced and um, it, it's just an added option or approach to dealing with life in general, you know, because they're being introduced to all kinds of new things all the time. It's, it's funny how adults can listen to something and say, well, I don't think they're, that they receive that. While at the same time, in educational introduce institutions they're being introduced to new stuff all the time <laughs> you know what I mean and it, you know it, it's expected to happen there but if it's something that's not a part of the the institution and you talk about introducing it now it's I, well, I don't know if that's something that they'd be interested in receiving you know well they they weren't interested in receiving what they've been introduced to anyway but still being introduced to it and receiving it and sometimes making the decision whether to accept it or reject it. So uh, for me, the, the next private conversation I uh, would like to do would be one that included young people and them, us interacting and having a discussion about some of the things that are on their mind as opposed to them being in an environment where they're being dictated to as far as what to think and how to think and what they're supposed to do. 
So if you can keep that in mind, that's, 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 that's what it would be about. You know, that's what I like to do. And ultimately, I definitely want to uh, go into the institutions as well. And that's why I'm working on finishing this book so that um, I can have something to say, hey, check it out. Take it or leave it, you know. But we always have the same challenges, you know. People want to say, people want to stay in the realm of right and wrong and agree and disagree. And, I, and I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm just as consistent in this conscious conversations where we don't have to agree or disagree and we don't have to get involved in right and wrong. You just understand, that's all. And uh, any other thoughts flying through the brains? Theo? Um. Mike? What I wanted to ask you was, um, what are the roots of this conflict mindset that is in this society? Where, where does it originate? To be honest with you, I have no idea where the conflict mindset originates, but I do know the conflict mindset can be managed. And it's not necessary to have a conflict mindset. And so that's what I work on. How we can not have a conflict mindset and how we can try to move forward with understanding. So I want to read this something that I wrote. It's called Be Humble. And, and you have it in the book here as well. Um, because for me, this kind of helps to remind me to stay on track when I'm in interacting with people. Um, and it's just something I wrote a while back. And it says, what we know is very little. And there's always someone who knows a little more than the tiny bit we think we know. In the context of all existence and unknown information, let me put on my spectaculars. In the context of all existence and unknown information, what we think we know and understand is but one speck of dust from one grain of sand in one puzzle piece made up of an infinite number of grains of sand in one puzzle made up of an infinite number of puzzle pieces, in one universe made up of an infinite number of puzzles, in a potentially infinite number of universes, which brings us to this. If a lifetime was 10,000 years and we lived a million lifetimes, there would still be next levels of understanding available to us as lessons for next levels of understanding. So compared to all there is to know, what we think we know and understand is little to nothing, which means it never makes sense to argue over information, especially when we understand that with new information, what was new and true yesterday can become obsolete and false today. Ultimately, this means there is so much that we do not know that we really have no idea what's not possible, which also means that for us, everything that we can think of in our own life lane is possible. It is just a matter of us finding our own life lane and acquiring the knowledge and skills needed to transition our ideas of thoughts and limited understandings from consciousness to reality. There are only th three things I know for sure, life, challenges, and physical death. I love you. And I always say, um, and, and, and so this, this is just, a. Uh, for me, a constant reminder of that it's just too much that we don't know to be arguing over the little bit we think we do know. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's it. And, and I will say, like I always say, I love you and I always will. And I will absolutely never, ever give up on my people, ever. You'll never hear me say, um, okay, you know what, I'm, my people, forget, hey, it's, it's off. I'm out for me now, it's a wrap. I didn't gave up on these Negroes. It's, and I done heard many leaders say that, prominent people say that. And like, it's like, I understand where you're coming from. 
But where I am is such that I understand that we functioning with a consciousness that was created by white people after a 400 year period. That bear on the bicycle, it was only four years before he was out of his natural mind. Well, they had us for 400 unedited, uninterrupted years. Whose mindset do you think we operating with? How can we sit back and look at those among us and say, that's a sh look at them. We don't say that about the bear when we see him on the bike. At most, we're entertained. And on a higher level of thinking, we say, wow, he's been trained very well. But we never look at the bear with disgust. Look at this stupid bear. Can't he just claw the trainer and run for freedom? But when we look at our own people, that's the attitude we take. Without understanding that we function in with a consciousness they created, no matter whether we like it or not. And, but that has never been addressed. They one day said, okay, y'all free. And we said, okay, we's free. And then we just started no counseling, no, no social work, you know, no assistance. Nobody helped us say, hey, hey, your mind is effed up. Is, uh, we put something in there that just ain't going to have you functioning well for the next thousand years. And we haven't even addressed it. But we can look around at our people with all that we've accomplished. We, we got billionaires amongst us. We got the most popular people in the world. And the, one of the things that's a telltale sign that we, we still have a lot of work to do is when you are hundreds of millions of dollars, even billions, hundreds of thousands, you're rich, famous, and part of your object, objective in life is to stay relevant. You, you, we, we can't be functioning in our right mind if, if that's a part of our to stay relevant. To who and for what? That is a, a desire to be validated. And when you need to be validated, you're a slave. That means your entire personal peace is determined by how somebody else thinks about you. So how do you have $100 million and you still trying to be relevant in social media? Well, we, we got a lot of work to do on our consciousness. And nobody's addressing the consciousness. Right here in Hartford, Connecticut, we got all these fancy schools. They rebuild them, and, and they got real technical, nice names. And everybody dressing up in uniforms. and It's nobody addressing this consciousness. You can't create a midnight basketball program to stop violence if you're not addressing the mindset that's taking the violent actions. Even, again, my perspective, not necessarily the truth. Even our religious teachings, the love of money is the root of all evil. That's a deflection. The foul consciousness of man is the root of all evil. A man with a foul consciousness can pick up anything and make it foul. Gun, money, book, whatever. So if we're dealing with real, we can't even, we can't be teaching the kids money's bad and, and as crazy as this might sound to other people, guns are bad. No, the person holding the gun who does foul things is bad because the consciousness is determining the actions. And if we want to improve the quality of our reality, we have to improve the quality of our decisions. The way we improve the quality of our decisions is to improve the quality of our consciousness. So this consciousness has to be addressed with young people and, 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 and those long in the tooth as well. <laughs> we got to deal with this consciousness. We can't keep skipping over it. We done skipped over it for uh, how, how long did we, are we have supposed to have been free since 1865? Uh, 200 years? So I'm just, <laughs> no, I'm just saying. We, 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 uh, 
we've been avoiding this consciousness thing and it keeps slapping us back in the face and say, hey, this need to be addressed. You know, I thought about it some years ago when Martin Lawrence, he was at the top of his game, making all the money in the world, rich and famous. And he in Hollywood standing on the corner naked directing traffic talking about somebody going to kill him. We got to deal with this consciousness. Got to deal with the consciousness. So that's where it's at. If anybody else has something to say in closing, we can do this. Uh, okay, cool. Well, I, I thank y'all for coming. I definitely appreciate it. And, and I will say again, the next time we have a private conversation, I would like for each person invited to bring a young person. I hope everybody put their email, reaffirm the email on the list. And, um, and we'll go from there. And I, I'll keep you posted and let you know when the next one is. Are y'all cool with bringing a young person? OK, wonderful. All right. Thank y'all for coming. We out. Stan. Hey. My man Stan is running for mayor in Hartford, Connecticut. And uh, Stan the man. So I'm, I'm wishing him much success. I, I don't necessarily, I don't, I don't, I'm not an active participant in the whole voting process, and that can be a whole new discussion, but I still support him, and, and I hope that he's successful in his run for mayor. I just wanted to say that. All right, thank y'all for hanging out.